January 1835, the villagers of Salem, a tiny settlement in the Eastern Cape Colony in South Africa, are anxiously waiting for an imminent Amakosa attack. A few days earlier, a large Amakosa force under the command of Chief Makoma invaded the Cape, burning farmhouses and seizing cattle wherever they went. Now, the Salem settlers braced themselves for a similar fate. Suddenly, a group of some 500 Amakosa warriors appear on the ridge of one of the hills overlooking Salem. The settlers are terrified at the sheer size of the Amakosa force. They seek refuge in the church and the men ready their weapons for the inevitable assault. But then, to everyone's astonishment, including the Amakosa, one man decides to ride out to meet the warrior. What happens next would forever be engraved into Eastern Cape folklore. How's it? My name is Dr. Jacob Asaynos, and as always, this is Stashy, and you're watching The Historian Stash. Now, our story takes place in the heart of the Seafelt, a strip of land in the Eastern Cape of South Africa between the Khamtuas River to the west and the Fish River to the east. At the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, this area was a perpetual war zone. Western Amakosa and Ku groups were struggling to maintain their territory as westward European expansion gained momentum. By the end of the 1760s, the Europeans had reached the seed felt. As they moved deeper into the seed felt, they started making contact with the westernmost Gosa Kingdom, opening up what would become the Eastern Frontier. Bombardiers, we got no fears, won't shed no tears, we're pushing the frontiers. Colonial expansion dispossessed the Amakosa and Ku of their land and cattle, which was pretty much a big deal for society that relied on farming. So retaliation was unavoidable, and then there would be retaliation to the retaliation. For almost a century, a series of wars and skirmishes between the European colonists and the Amatkosa and Ku took place on the eastern frontier. These became known as the frontier wars, or wars of dispossession as historians call them today. They started while the Dutch East India Company was still in charge of the Cape. The British took over in 1795 for a brief time, but the Dutch returned in 1803. Then in 1806, the British took permanent occupation of the Cape. By 1811, the British colonial authorities were determined to secure the eastern frontier once and for all. So they attempted to clear the entire sea felt of all Amakosa in what would become the Fourth War of Dispossession. After that war, the British went about constructing a network of forts and military barracks all along the frontier to prevent the Amakosa from returning to the Seafell. The center of this network was the military barracks of Grahamstown. But the Amakosa were, to put it mildly, not happy about the British building forts to keep them out of land, which was theirs. Also, large numbers of cattle were being stolen by colonists on the pretext that they were recovering cattle that was stolen from them. This sparked off the Fifth War of 1819. On the 22nd of April 1819, around 8,000 Amakosa warriors led by Makanda Ngaeve 
attacked Grahamstown. But due to the might of the British cannon and accurate rifle fire, the attack failed. After the Fifth War, the British authorities realized that the frontier could not be closed. So they came up with a plan to create a buffer zone between the colony and Kosaland. The area selected was the sea felt, but they also needed their own people to willingly settle in the area. They didn't have a shortage of volunteers because Britain in the early 19th century was, to put it mildly, in turmoil. Following the Napoleonic Wars, the British Isles were overpopulated and many Britons were unemployed. The British government was keen to get rid of this problem by essentially shipping sections of the population to other parts of the world. More than 90,000 Britons applied, but eventually 4,000 were selected. These people came from all walks of life, from England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. One of them was a 30-year-old carpenter from the village of Beer in Devon. His name was Richard Gash. Now, old Richard was a Quaker, which meant that he didn't drink, wore plain dress and was non-violent. By all accounts, he was a humble, soft-spoken man. He had a young family of three children with his wife, Margaret Evans. By 1820, Richard was ready to seek greener pastures elsewhere. He, like other prospective settlers, was sold on the idea that a better life awaited them in this far-off magical place called the Cape. So Richard and his family joined a party of settlers led by this oak called Hezekiah Sefton from London, who also happened to be a carpenter. The party of 344 was split into two because one ship was not big enough to accommodate them all. The first group of Sefton's party embarked on the Aurora on the 5th of January 1820. The second group embarked on the Brilliant along with the Pringle and Erith parties. Richard was appointed the leader of this second group. With the Thames River frozen over, the settlers had to wait for two months before they could depart. This made the already claustrophobic conditions aboard even more uncomfortable. Many on board saw this as a sign for things to come and decided rather to remain behind in the slum and squalor they knew than head into the unknown. Eventually, both ships set sail on the 15th of February, 1820. The Gash family stayed close, with Richard trying to comfort his family with daily prayers. But tragedy struck when their youngest son, Joseph, died of pneumonia during the voyage. He was only six months old. After a journey of almost three months, the two ships finally arrived in Algoa Bay in mid-May. On Friday the 19th of May, small landing boats came alongside the Aurora and the Brilliant, ready to transport the travel-weary settlers to shore. It would take another nine days to complete disembarkation of both ship's passengers. The scene that met Richard Gash and his family on the beaches of Algoa Bay was chaotic with what writer, poet and fellow settler on board the Brilliant, Thomas Pringle, described as the boisterous hilarity of the people who felt their feet on firm ground for the first time after a wearisome voyage. There were lines of men conveying luggage from the boats to ox wagons, ready to transport the settlers to their respective locations. The wagons carrying the Sefton settlers made their way in a northeasterly direction, crossing the Swartkops and Sundays rivers and up the Addo Heights. They crossed the Bushman's River at Rottenbach Drift, northwest of their destination at Asagai Bos River. However, the Boer wagon drivers were on their own mission and continued onwards across virgin country, crossing the Karicha River and heading due south, passing the mission station of Theopolis before heading due east and eventually setting at the Rietfontein, known today as Barvel Park. The journey was arduous with the heavy wagons on barely recognizable passes, descending steep and precipitous hills and crossing rivers. The Boer wagon drivers had selected the route to be taken 
so the setters had no idea where they were going or where they were meant to be. The wagons bumped unremittingly over rocks hidden in the long grass, sometimes passing along the edges of high precipices. But Rietfontein was not where they were supposed to be. When the authorities found out about the mistake, they forced those Sefton setters at Rietfontein to get back on the ox wagons and come back the way they had gone, past the Opolis, crossing the Karecha once more, eventually arriving at their final destination on the 18th of July. Meanwhile, those Sefton setters still at Algoa Bay were making their way straight to Asagai Bos River location after the removal of the settlers from Rietfontein. Barentwoest, a boer whose farm was in the vicinity, led that wagon train from Algoa Bay, joining the rest of their fellow Sefton party settlers on the 23rd of July. When they arrived, there was no support system or anyone to help them with their transition. They were essentially dumped there to fend for themselves. The flimsy tents which were temporarily loaned by the government proved to be useless against the rain and cold. Most settlers took up their allocated plots of land or allotments all along the banks of the Asagai Bos. Others moved into the smaller neighbouring valleys. At the suggestion of the party's minister, the young Methodist Reverend William Shaw, the location was named Salem or Place of Peace with reference to Psalm 76 in the Bible. Thus, it had nothing to do with the infamous town with the same name in Massachusetts, USA. Hear ye, hear ye, the court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, County of Salem, the village of Salem is now in session. Though this Salem would gain its own fair share of infamy in later years. The lack of adequate building materials added to the settlers' frustrations. They were used to living in brick or stone dwellings but the conditions in Salem placed severe limitations on what could be done. Bricks were simply unavailable and stone was difficult to shape and took too much time. Simpler methods were needed to meet their urgent housing needs. Some employed a technique referred to as wattle and daub, a quick but fairly permanent building process that originated from Northern Europe. Nearly all of the original houses of Salem were built this way, but Old Richard chose a more unconventional means of finding shelter. In the first seven years at Salem, the Gush family occupied a large cave on the banks of the Asagai Bos before he built his house. I guess he refused to cave in to building a normal house. But did you get it? Did you get it? During this initial period of building, Richard and his fellow settlers would roam the surrounding cliffs in search of wood to make doorposts and rafters. Wattle and thatch were usually obtained closer to the home for the walls and roofs. Even before construction, many settlers had already laid out gardens in the alluvial soil close to the streams and river. Indigenous vegetation was cleared to make way for horticultural activities. The ground was turned by hand before the first seeds were sown. As most of the settlers were city dwellers and no training program was in place to educate them in horticulture or agriculture, the lessons they learned were, needless to say, harsh. There are various accounts of settlers from elsewhere in the Albany district where carrot seeds were placed at the bottom of trenches which were a foot deep, or seed potatoes thrown on the ground surface and expected to grow where it lay, much to the amusement of the neighboring Boer residents. During this period, Salem would be faced with a mass exodus as many settlers could not bear to stay, relocating to other parts of Albany in search of a better life. Meanwhile, Richard and Margaret were quietly creating a new life for themselves at the southern tip of Africa. Margaret gave birth to another son called Joseph on the 4th of March 1821. Over the next 15 years, she would bear five more children, three boys and two girls. Despite all the hardships that life on the frontier presented, things finally looked promising for the Gushes. But on the 10th of August 1833, they suffered another tragedy when their eldest son 
Richard Thomas, died at the age of only 15. Two years later, they would lose yet another son, John Granger, also at a very early age. A death of a child is always heartbreaking for a parent, but to lose three children at a young age must have been especially devastating. But despite their grief, Richard and Margaret found strength in their unwavering faith. Richard was convinced that God had sent him to the furthest ends of the British Empire to live a life of devotion and servitude to the Lord. He did not have a lot, but he felt that he could help others with the talents he was given. In 1822, Richard oversaw the construction of the chapel and 10 years later he helped with the building of the original church. He was intent on helping where he could and many of the original houses in Salem were built with the help of Richard Gash. But just as Richard and his fellow settlers were enjoying a newfound and much needed period of prosperity, the threat of war loomed on the horizon. By the early 1830s, British colonial authorities had wrongly decided to seize the land between the Fish and the Keskama rivers, making the Keskama the new boundary of Kosa land. That land belonged to Chief Nika, who was formerly an ally of the Cape Colony. But this unjustified land grab by the colonial authorities incensed the various Amakosa groups, who were now vying for control of the land that was left. The colonial authorities had unwittingly painted a huge target on the backs of the settlers of the Albany district. On the 31st of December 1834, the Amakosa led by the Amagalekas and the Chief Makoma, invaded the Cape Colony, leading to the outbreak of the Sixth War. The large invasion force, numbering around 12,000 warriors, compelled settlers to abandon virtually the entire Albany district, except for Grahamstown and Fort Beaufort. Farmhouses were burned to the ground, colonists were killed, and thousands of cattle were seized by the Amakosa force. Salem sat right in the path of this onslaught. Shortly after the outbreak of the war, a Salem settler named James Rawlins took the village's cattle out to graze on Salem's communal grounds. Rawlins was accompanied by a man named Carpenter and two coup herdsmen. They moved over the crest of a hill only a few hundred meters from Salem. At the same time, an Amakosa force was waiting for them on the other side of the hill. They hid themselves in the bush and dry riverbed, ready to strike. As the unsuspecting Rawlins and co. came over the hill, they were out of sight from the rest of the village. The force then attacked, killing Rawlins and Carpenter and wounding a coup herder. The other coup herder escaped and ran towards Salem to alert the residents. A rescue party was mustered, but the settlers took too long and by the time they arrived on the scene, the Amakosa had fled along with approximately 100 head of cattle. The bodies of Rawlins and Carpenter were found with multiple stab wounds, while the wounded crew herdsman had managed to escape into a small ravine where he was later discovered by the rescue party. This attack paralyzed the Salem community with fear. Until then, they had been largely untouched by the Amakosa but now they sensed that Chief Makoma's warriors would not spare their village. Many of them fled and sought refuge in Grahamstown. Those who chose to stay behind gathered in the church and schoolroom at the center of Salem. They barricaded both buildings, boarding up doors and windows, but left just enough space for the barrels of their muskets to peek through. Old Richard was one of those who stayed behind, but as a Quaker, he abhorred violence. While the rest of the men were preparing for battle, Richard was praying for a peaceful outcome. Then, a couple of days after the first attack, that which the Salem settlers had feared came to fruition. A force of around 500 Amakosa warriors appeared on top of a hill to the northwest of Salem. From there, the Amakosa had a commanding view over the little village. They would have seen the settlers scrambling towards the church, 
they would have heard the ringing of the church bell and the cries of despair coming from the tiny village. For the settlers, on the other hand, they would have first seen the dust being churned up into the air by 500 enraged warriors. Then they would have seen the warriors appear on the ridge, their spears glistening in the hot summer sun. In between the ringing of the church bell, the settlers would have heard the distant shouting of the leaders of the assault force as they barked orders down the line. The moment was extremely tense with neither the warriors on the top of the hill nor the settlers down in the village sure of their fate. What exactly happened next is not clear as inevitably both sides have their own versions. The most accepted version from the settler side goes as follows. Upon seeing the armed group on the hill, Richard got up and informed the group inside the church that he was going to attempt to negotiate with the leaders of the Amitkosa not to attack Salem. The group must have thought that old Richard had forgotten his oath not to touch alcohol and had probably raided the Holy Communion wine. They pleaded with him not to leave as certain death awaited him if he did. But Richard assured them that if this were to be his end, then it was God's will, and if he was killed, maybe his death would provide enough distraction for the rest of the settlers to flee. Barend Woost, the trekboer who had transported many of the Sefton party 15 years prior, had in the meantime been appointed as field cornet of the area, and so he volunteered to ride out with Richard to meet the Amakosa. According to this version, two other settlers accompanied them. They rode out slowly and when they came to within earshot of the Amatrosa, Richard took off his coat to show that he was unarmed and asked them if anyone spoke Dutch. Two men came forward. He then asked why they threatened to kill his people and burn their homes. The answer he got back was not what he was expecting. The Amatrosa replied that they were not intent on killing the settlers, but they were hungry. Richard responded by saying that they had no reason to be hungry because they had already seized the cattle all around them. The two Amatkosa men then answered that they just wanted bread, to which Richard agreed that they take as much from the village as they want on condition that they do not attack Salem. The armed group agreed but insisted that Richard fetch the bread himself. He obliged and returned a short while later with what is recorded as 15 pounds of bread, 10 pounds of tobacco and 25 pocket knives. He then told the force to give these to their chiefs and tell them that these gifts come from one who would neither steal nor kill his fellow men. The Amatrosa then withdrew and Salem was spared for the duration of the war. Interestingly, an Amatkosa version of the story goes that Richard and Amatkosa had a misunderstanding in what they were negotiating about. According to this version, Richard met with the armed group and told them that he did not come to this country to fight with them. Richard told them that this land and cattle belonged to the Amatkosa. Then Richard allegedly gave the Amatkosa group some seed, presumably as a token of peace. Then. Apparently an argument broke out as to who would reap the fruits born on this land. However, it still somehow ended in peace, as both versions conclude that the Amatkosa never attacked Salem again. Later, the settlers and their descendants would celebrate the actions of Richard Gash in every conceivable way. In 1959, a stone pillar with a plaque commemorating the event was erected in front of the original church which still stands today. Another stone pillar was erected on the hilltop where the negotiations between Richard and the Amatkosa took place. Also in 1959, Professor Winifred Maxwell, former head of the Department of History at Rhodes University, delivered a memorial lecture in Salem on Setter's Day. In her lecture, she commemorated old Richard as the simplest and greatest of Setters. He even had a play written about his life by none other than renowned playwright Guy Butler. This play was later turned into a made-for-TV movie in 1984. Richard Gash, or at least an idealized characterization of him, 
has been firmly entrenched within the settler collective memory. Now, as an historian, I have found that the significance of multiple versions of events have always been underplayed when an event is just trivial, but when something of great importance is at stake, then people tend to pay more attention to the different versions of events. Currently, there is a massive land claim going on in Salem, with 66 square kilometers of land at stake. This claim has gone through every court imaginable, including the Constitutional Court, which is the highest court in the country. Even though the factual basis for the claim chiefly took place a century after the Richard Gush versus Large Amakosa Force incident, both the black African claimants and the white landowners made it a focal point in both of their arguments. The fundamental disparity between the claimant's version and the landowner's version is important in understanding the claimant's opposition to white settler claims to the land, and vice versa. The settlers and the descendants believed that they had title to the land because of some sense of entitlement to it, acquired through years of toil and hardship. Besides, when they arrived in Salem, there was no one else in occupation of the land. However, their concept of occupation differed significantly from that of the Amakosa. To the Amakosa, there was no spatial demarcations, no sealing off of one area from another area. Their transhumans patterns traversed physical borders such as rivers and mountains. The Amakosa lived as they moved. The idea of a town with fixed borders was inconceivable, so the claimant's version challenges the settler's notion that this land was theirs alone to inhabit and settle upon. As a result, the story of what Richard Gash did on that hot January day in 1835 has been weaponized by both sides to help them achieve a specific legal outcome. But what about the real Richard Gash? Well, he continued to live quietly in Salem, helping where he could. In 1853, Joseph, his first child born in South Africa, bought the farm Kripgat near the village of Sidbury. Joe renamed it Woodbury so that it would be easier for him to pronounce. By now, Richard and Margaret were very long in the tooth and decided to go live with their son on the farm. Then, a few years later, on the 29th of September 1858, Richard Gash, the God-loving carpenter who saved his village from attack, finally met his maker. Margaret would join him 23 years later, after living until the ripe old age of 90. The life of Richard Gash has been used by various prominent academics, artists, lawyers and politicians to illustrate the true grit, metal and resourcefulness typically associated with the 1820 British settlers. The settlers have often been heralded as pioneers by the succeeding generations of predominantly white English South Africans. On the flip side of the coin, in the eyes of black South Africans, the settlers represent a painful colonial past in which their ancestors were subjugated and brutalized for the enrichment of a white minority. But both of these narratives miss a crucial point. The settlers were people. They were ordinary people, thrust into an extraordinary situation by a regime that did not know what it was doing. In the end, they did what they had to do to survive and eke out an existence in this foreign land they gradually came to call home. Similarly, Richard Gash was just an ordinary man who lived by morals and devotion. He kept his faith despite unspeakable suffering and he always chose non-violence, even if that was the unpopular choice to make. Richard Gash was not the epitome of the setter spirit. He was not the epitome of anything. He was just a man, a man of principle, a man of peace. That is the real Richard Gash of Salem. That's it for now. Until next time, stay stashy.